Hey folks, Dave from Nerdarchy, for nerds by nerds, hanging out with this nerd. Nerdarch is dead. Today we're going to dive back into Deep Magic series with Dragon Magic. Jump down to the description below where you can sign up for Nerdarchy the newsletter, get weekly gaming tips, as well as learn how to game with us. While you're down there, you'll also find a link to Drive Through RPG where you can pick up your copy of Deep Ma from the Deep Magic series, Dragon Magic. All right. So as, as always, we uh, we do the breakdown of you know who's responsible for this. So why don't you uh, get into that, Dave? All right. So our credits for design are Sean Merwin. Development and editing is Steve Winter. Art director and graphic design is Mark Rattle. The cover art is Felipe Escobar, which I'm probably butchering the names. Which you guys, come on, you know. You know how he does it here. <laughs> Interior art is Felipe Escobar. Again, Michael Jax, uh, Gideo Kuip, and Brian Sim. And, of course, we have our publisher, Wolfgang Bauer, because it's Cobalt Press. Absolutely. So we, we get, you know, this is a Deep Magic number 13, Dragon Magic. We get one tradition. We get a whopping nine feats, 16 new spells that are an assortment of uh, uses, not just wizards. And one of those spells is Ritual. So we get, you know, the spells are listed as, you know, Bard, Sorcerer, Cleric, Warlock. There's actually a Paladin spell in there as well. So it was pretty nice. Yeah, it's spread, it's spread all over. And then our, then the tradition we get is dra basically the tradition of uh, Dragon Mage. And they get a lot of interesting abilities that don't really have anything to do with spellcasting. They are able to empower themselves using their spell slots to do other things. So this is a interesting thing to do, and I know we've said a lot of a lot of these deep magics are awesome for use as N NPCs. Some of them, you know, mo most of them work out well as a PC thing. This one here, not because of power level, just because of usage. I, I just don't see players wanting to make this choice. And go down this road. It's it's just really, really wonky. First thing they get is the invoke the dragon mask. Now the way all of their powers work is they invoke an aspect of the dragon. They get a visual spectral change to you know to them. They grow wings. They grow a tail. They grow uh, a heart, a, a head. <laughs> they grow you know a growth on their chest. Um, and all whenever you invoke one of these abilities. Your, you get an, a, an array of abilities, but in order to do so, you use a spell slot, and it lasts a number of rounds equal to three times the level of the spell slot expended in, in round duration. Well, it depends on the ability, but the okay. first one is definitely Sorry. that. Yes. For the, for the Dragon Mask, it lasts three rounds times the level of the spell that, that's used... And you, for the first one, you get a bonus to your AC equal to your intelligence modifier. That's pretty darn cool. And it's a it's a bonus, so it doesn't say that it, you know, doesn't stack with something. So that that's cool. You gain a bite attack. It does 1d8 plus your intelligence modifier, piercing damage, and it counts as magical for the purposes of a damage reduction. And this is going to be the focus of what you're doing. You want to, to focus on, you know, that bite. Because the other things you're going to normally do aren't as good. Well, and for that, like I, I'll touch on that briefly. As I've said many times, if you are a wizard or spellcaster and you're essentially hitting something, you just about always have a better option than doing that. And when you're biting, you're just hitting them. So it, it's not a great, I don't think it's a great option for a caster. I wholeheartedly agree. Aside from that, you get advantage on wisdom perception checks and on charisma intimidation checks. Uh, and here's the here's the downside. You make ranged melee and spell attacks with disadvantage, and targets have advantage on their saving throws against your spells. So there's no mitigating factor. You grow this thing, and because your magic is so empowered, this dragon visage that's spectrally covering your head, you suck at spellcasting. Right, like that's the whole purpose of what I do in life, is I'm a spellcaster, and this thing for a bite attack and a better AC makes me suck at it. So, as a bonus action, you can spend an additional spell slot to augment your dragon mask. Your next bite attack is made with advantage and does an additional 1d8 piercing damage per level of the spell expended. So, it doesn't increase your duration. I use a, I use a spell and 
I can bite for more damage. Okay, that's an interesting way to expend your spell slots so that you're not using them for, you know, th this thing here. I just, it's... It's really. I would wonky. never use this ability. Pretty much, I, I'm like uh, unless your unless your plan is to armor up and be like, I'm just going to buff the party in these combats. Then you might use it. But other than that, it it, it seems to go against five E design as well in the sense that there's negatives. Usually, everything in five E is you get something, or if you get a negative, like like certain spells will give you exhaustion, but it's after the end. So, I I just feel like for those first. You know, those, those first four levels, you know, between two and six that you've got this thing here, it is the bulk of your ability that, that you're going to be able to do, and it's not very good. So, it gets better, though. Invoking Dragonheart at sixth level, uh, you, you can invoke a magical Dragonheart, a translucent magical force in the form of a beating heart covers your chest. So, you just get this pulsing, you know, growth. That's, I imagine, the spectral, just like the, the heart. You know, covering you, and just like everything else, it it lasts for a duration of three rounds times the level of the spell slot ex expended. If you become incapacitated, or you end it, or you replace it with another dragon aspect, it goes away. With this one, you gain a bonus to wisdom and charisma saving throws equal to your intelligence modifier. You gain temporary hit points equal to your wizard level. Uh, you gain a breath weapon attack. Uh, it's a 30-foot line that does 3d6 damage, and you choose the energy type between Acid, Cold, Fire, or Lightning. Uh, and you choose that, that type once when you invoke the heart, or when you use this ability, and for the duration of that particular heart, it is set, although you can change it next time. Uh, and then you can, as with the, the Dragon Bite, you can add more potency to your Dragon Breath, by sacrificing spell slots, it does an additional 2d6 damage and goes an extra 10 foot longer for each level of the spell slot that you use on this particular ability. Now, again, it's kind of, this is thematic and cool. The bonus to saving throws is great. Great uh, getting twice your, your wizard level and temporary hit points, also good. Uh, being able to change the energy type of damage, great. But the amount of damage you're doing for your spell levels not so great when you compare it to actually casting spells, you know. So it's like you gotta really want to breathe fire or acid or whatever to use this for it to be effective. I mean, at this point, in my opinion, you're better off just casting spells. A fireball is going to be eight do eight die six. That's a third level spell. Here, you know, you could bump things up, and it's it's like just as good, you know, or slightly better. Um, but you're also not covering the same kind of area that a fireball does. Like the biggest benefit is probably going to be changing that energy type. Right. Which you would do each time that you adopt the form. Uh, so the next thing at 10th level, you get the ability to invoke dragon wings. Uh, this round, uh, or this particular invocation, uh, it only lasts two rounds times the, the, the level of the spell that's used, as opposed to three like the others. Uh, and while you're in this form, uh, you get a increased speed of 10 feet, and you get a fly speed equal to your walking speed. You gain resistance to non-magical bludgeoning, piercing, and slashing damage. You have advantage on melee and spell uh, attack rolls. As a bonus action, you can spend an additional spell slot to augment your wings. Uh, when you do so, your fly speed increases by 5 feet times the level of the spell slot ex expended. Additionally, you can choose one creature per level of the extended spell slot. Until the start of your next turn, range attacks made against selected creatures are made with disadvantage if the target is within 10 feet of you. By far, this is probably the best one, you know, because you can fly around and just rain death upon your enemies. Uh, you know, it is the most interesting use of your spell slots, although fly is a third level spell. But, you know, here I don't think you have to worry about concentration, so that that's a big that's a big boost. You know, getting resistance to damage that's not magical is great. Increased speed is good. And that advantage on melee and rage spell attacks is also going to be really useful. I wholeheartedly agree, uh, which is why it's, you know, two rounds per level as opposed to, you know, three like the other ones. 14th level, you get the Invoke Dragon Tail. Uh, and this is this is one is completely wonky. You essentially grow a tail that's like 15 foot long. You know, more than twice your 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 height if you're an average uh, you know humanoid. Uh, while you're 
While you wear the tail, you gain the following benefits. You are immune to the grappled condition. You have proficiency on strength and dexterity saving throws and on strength checks. In addition, you can opt to use your intelligence modifier instead of your strength or dex modifier on those saving throws and skill checks. It's also one where it only lasts a round per spell level slot. So they, they go down as you, as you gain levels. Uh, you gain a tail attack. Uh, each target uh, within 15 feet that you want to hit... Uh, Takes three die ten plus your intelligence modifier and bludgeoning damage, and is pushed ten feet away from you. Uh, makes a strength saving throw against your spell DC, uh, or be knocked prone. The attack is considered magical for purposes of overcoming a target's immunity or resistance to bludgeoning damage. Uh, as a reaction, you can make a tail attack against a creature that approaches to within fifteen feet of you. Uh, and as a bonus action, you can expend a, a spell slot to augment your tail. Doing so increases the damage of your tail by 1, 1d10 times the level of the spell slot exp expended. Uh, and then, as well as, in addition, you regain hit points equal to 3 times the level of the spell slot. So, and that that's the Dragon Mage tradition. And, and like we said, this is this is the first time I'm like, hmm, nah, I'm not really feeling this one at all. Um, I, I would discourage... Uh, players from going down this path. It's a very weird mechanic of saying, ah, I've got all these spell slots, but I'm not going to use them to cast all these wondrous spells that I've got. I'm going to do these weird dragony abilities. I wouldn't discourage them. I just wouldn't, wouldn't I wouldn't really understand why they would want to play it. <laughs> but, you know, if you're into be, being, you know, draped in spectral dragon parts, this is definitely a tradition for you. Absolutely. So, as I said, there's a whole bunch of feats that you can wind up getting. Um, and the first one mitigates that Dragon Mask ability of, oh, you suck at spellcasting while you have this, because now you have the careful Dragon Mask. Uh, you've mastered the ability to cast spells while wearing your Dragon Mask. With this feat, you no longer have disadvantage on attack rolls with spells and cantrips, and the targets of your spells don't have advantage on saving throws while you're under the effect of the Dragon Mask. So to have a feat to counteract the sucky ability of your archetype, it's, it's great. It says volumes <laughs> uh, uh, in and of itself. Uh, so the next one is dual dragon aspect. This one is actually really cool because this lets you put on two dragon aspects at once. Now, granted, you know you, it's going to cost to do that, and you're going to go eat, eat up your your spells really fast. But you know, if you want to be flying and breathing fire or acid or whatever, you know it works really well. I don't know if it's a like an awesome use of your spell slots, though. Do, essentially, when you invoke a second aspect, rather than canceling out the other one, the other one will last for an additional round before it goes away. So you're taking a feat to get an extra one round out of an ability. So if you're planning to layer, this is a way that you can keep bumping those things to, together if you really want. Uh, Fearsome Dragon Mask, uh, when you successfully make an attack... With your dragon bite, they make a wisdom saving throw or they're afraid of you. Pretty uh, pretty cut and dry. Yeah, so now we have two feats to make that ability better. So, I don't know. It feels like too much effort has gone into that ability. Uh, Radiant Dragon Heart allows you to add the Radiant option to your list of energy types for your breath weapon. As well as uh, it can cause the, the blinding condition to those that have been affected by your breath weapon. Well, no, it, it's, it doesn't just add the option. Your damage is radiant addition to. Okay. And then the blinded. So it's like, you know, radiant fire, radiant acid, radiant lighting, lightning, as the case may be. So it makes it, it makes it a little bit better. It gives you another option. Great for fighting undead. And, of course, the blindness at the end is good. Um, and, then, you know, it doesn't matter if you're not using that a lot. And it's, it's, a, it's a heavy investment when we're talking, you know, your stat bumps and feats. So next we go to find the Titan's weakness. Uh, you can spot the, the weakness in a foe's defenses. Uh, increase your wisdom score by 1 to a maximum of 20. As an action, you analyze the defenses of one larger, larger creature you can see. Your next attack against them is made with advantage, and any natural roll of an 18 or higher is considered a crit. I think it's pretty potent, but you know, you're trading an attack for it. Or you're trading an action for it, I should say. So I'm not, not against it. Yeah, and you still get a you still get a stat bump so to wisdom, so that makes it better. But again, it, the, I guess the thing is, you know, you're getting advantage and you get that extra crit range. But technically, if you just tack two two rounds in a row, you kind of like you you could it would be the same as if you crit if you hit both times. Right. But you know, it does increase your chances anyway. It's an option. It's an option. 
Next, we have Fortified Healer. So, healing magic is augmented by the fortifying magic of resolute bravery. If the target you target one or more allies with a spell that allows them to regain hit points, so the allies are immune to being frightened for a number of rounds equal to the level of the, of the healing spell. In addition, one ally who's healed hit points, your choice gains inspiration. You must complete a short, short alarm rest before you can grant inspiration again. So, being able to heal somebody and make them not afraid anymore, I, I, I think, is a, is a big bump. To totally worthwhile. If you're going to be fighting dragons, this is a fantastic feat to have. Yeah, not only that, you know, also, you know, granting inspiration. So, that, so that's actually a pretty decent feat. Uh, the next one is a, you know, very, very long-winded way of saying, you know, we've got Dragonsmith, you've got the ability to take, you know, parts of dragons and turn them into weapons and armor. Right, and if you make a weapon from them, they'll do an extra die six of the energy type. So, I mean, it's kind of cool and thematic if you if you want to be that person that makes stuff. Yeah, and armor all gives you resistance, as you would expect. Uh, Dragon Rider. Uh, th this is not the feat I was expecting it to be. It's actually, But it's better than the feat I was expecting it to be in, in a lot of ways. <laughs> I, I wholeheartedly agree. So this one allows you to get some, you know... While you're fighting something that is at least two size categories higher than larger than you, you can climb on them and attempt to take them down from be, you know being on their back, being whatever. Uh, so you you make a, str a strength ac athletics or dexterity acrobatics opposed by their dexterity acrobatics. Now a lot of large creatures don't have a high dex, so you're probably going to be pretty good at, at this one here. I know dragons are not proficient in, in acrobatics, and they typically have a 10 dex, so kudos for you. And yeah, I also like, I like this more so for small characters than medium sized, because they're going to get a lot more use out of it. Mm -hmm. But you know, once you actually are able to get on top of one of these creatures, you start getting some benefits like your first attack on them is advantage. When they try and attack you, they get disadvantage. disadvantage. And it's first attack per round. So you get some cool benefits. You know, a halfling rogue or a gnome rogue doing this is, is going to be kind of cool. You know, it, it, it actually puts you kind of out of harm's way by being in harm's way, <laughs> you know, because of the disadvantage. And that, you know, first attack advantage is great for a rogue. So, and, you know, the creature can dislodge you again by that opposed check that pretty naturally, like, they're just not going to be adept at doing it. So I think, I think this is definitely like the, the, the winning feat from this particular, uh, block of stats. Uh, the final one is unthreatening, and it's kind of like the ability to channel your inner kobold. <laughs> so you get a bump to your charisma, and you can you you can use your was it your reaction uh, when something's going to attack you to cower and grovel, and if they have another option, they'll attack that. They can still attack you, but you know it, it's 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 wonky. Um, you also get advantage to attack them, attack them right. on your next attack. So, you know, so that's what that is in a nutshell. Then we get into spells. So, as as I had stated, the, these spells they come from a wide array. It's not just all wizard spells. Uh, most of them are bard, bard, cleric, wizard, and warlock. Um, you know, all all interchanged. And there's nothing that says, "Oh, you can't take these spells." If you're not part of this tradition. So I kind of like that. It's like, oh, look, here's some new, you know, cleric -y spells for my cleric. Or there's some new bard spells for the bard. Here's a cool paladin spell. I, I kind of really like the first two. Okay. Uh, catch the breath, but which is essentially if a use a reaction and if a creature uses a breath weapon on you, you basically catch it and then you can channel it back at them on the next round, but it does force damage instead of the element damage, which is great because a lot of the problems with spells like Absorb Elements is it, you, generally if it's a monster that's going to use against you or a creature that's using against you, when you turn it back, they're probably either resistant or immune to the damage. So it's not nearly as effective. I mean, it's great against wizards and other casters, but not so much against you know, monster types. It's an eighth level spell, but there, there's a there's a special place in my heart for deadly sting. <laughs> uh, you grow a ten foot long tail as supple as a whip, tipped with a horrible stinger. During the spell's duration, you can use the stinger to make a melee spell attack with a reach of ten feet. On a hit, the target takes one d four piercing damage, plus four die ten poison damage, and a creature must make a successful Constitution saving throw or become vulnerable to poison damage for the duration of the spell. Last concentration up to a minute. 
So giving them vulnerability to poison damage and then being able to poison them for four die 10, I think is pretty nice. So our cantrip is uh, Dragon Roar, uh, which I like it thematically. I would make one tweak. So your voice is amplified to assault the mind of one creature. The target must make a charisma saving throw. If it fails, the target takes die for psychic damage and is frightened until the start of your next turn. A target can be affected by your dra dragon roar only once per 24 hours. I would totally ditch that. Uh, by their nature, cantrips are meant to be spammed. There are tons of cantrips in the player's handbook and throughout the game where you use it, there's an effect. The effect is actually cumulative and, and will happen every round. So I don't see I don't see why you would change this. I mean, you know, there's a saving throw involved anyway. It only lasts one round. I don't I don't think it's a great a, a, a game changer and it's only a die four points of damage. So yeah, give them let them be frightened every round if they keep failing. I wholeheartedly agree. Um, you know, we had mentioned earlier about the whole, you know, ability of, you know, draconic breath weapons. Well, there's a spell that's literally just dragon breath. It's fifth level evocation spell. Sorcerers, warlocks, and wizards get access to it. Lasts for concentration up to a minute. You get a breath weapon equivalent to, um, you know, one of the, one of the types, you know, black, blue, green, red, or white. It does six die six damage of an appropriate type. And whether it's a lion or a cone is dependent upon the type that you get. On each of your turns, you essentially get the recharge feature. If you roll a 5 or a 6 on that d6, you get your breath weapon back. So, not not fabulous with the reset feature. Um, but you do get to do it as a bonus action. But you do get to do it as a bonus action. So On those subsequent rounds. So if you get some good die rolls, this could be a great spell. But it could also be lame if you suck at rolling dice that day. It's like, oh, I did it once. And I kept up my concentration to do it once. Yeah. So, yeah, so it can be a little wonky, like, in, in that regards. So, ultimately, I think this is this is a good, a good get to have. Uh, I think the spells and, you know, a selection of the feats are a great addition to the game. I just don't feel that the, uh, the, the tradition is all okay. there. It's not a great player option. I might use it as an NPC in my game. I think it works really well that whether you're talking about friendly or an enemy because you can really play with the abilities and there's going to be some cool things with it. The The highlight for this to me is the, is the spells and some of the feats are, are decent enough. Uh, but if you want to add more uh, dr dragons and draconic things to your game, this would definitely add to it. Um, but the question is, guys, are you using it in your game? Would you use it in your game? we got a place where we can talk about that. That is down in the comments below. While you're at it, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. While you're down there, don't forget to check the description and get your own copy of Dragon Magic. So until next time, stay, stay nerdy. nerdy.